been our theme verse as we have been looking at the subject of the incarnation. 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now we're up to lesson number four. Uh, in our first lesson, again, we defined the word car incarnation. What does that mean? It means the enfleshment. It deals with the subject of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the eternal second person of the Godhead, becoming man, becoming fully man, becoming truly man. And then also in that first lesson, we looked at those prophecies that foretold uh, of the one that would come. The second lesson, we looked at the two natures of Christ. We looked at how he is fully, completely, totally God, 100%. And then we also looked at how he's completely, fully, totally man. But both of those are true. Two natures in the one person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not half God and half man. Jesus was not man in a body and God in spirit. He was all man. He body, soul, completely. And he was completely holy God. And then in our lesson last week, lesson number three, we looked at why it had to be so. We looked at why Jesus Christ had to be completely man. He had to be man to be uh, a real substitute for us. He had to be really man to partake of our nature, to, uh, to submit himself to the, to the temptations, to the struggles and trials of flesh and manhood, all of those things he identified with. Of course, he also had to be God. There had to be an infinite. There had to be a supreme value and dignity in all that he did um, so that it would have um, the full and necessary value. Tonight, we're up to part number four. Tonight, we're going to look at what we'll call the two states, the two states of Christ's incarnation. Christ was not always man. Jesus has always been God, is God, and will always be God. Jesus Christ is man, will always be man, but Jesus Christ was not always man. That was something that he became in time. But he did, he did become a man, and we know that he'll never lay aside his humanity. So in theology, we look at Christ's incarnation in two states, the state of humiliation and the state of exaltation. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, the two states of his incarnation. First of all, let's look at the humiliation of Christ, okay? The humiliation of Christ. Now, to humiliate, you guys can probably, you guys maybe even used that term before. To humiliate means to reduce to a lower position. We know what it means to feel humiliated, right? To feel like we've been reduced. You know, we, we, we do something and we just blow it and we feel like we have just shrunk in everyone's estimation, or someone does something to us to humiliate us and make us seem, feel, uh, or be reduced in our position. Well, the Bible says that that is true about the Lord Jesus Christ. We would deal with the subject of his humiliation. We're talking about Christ reducing himself, lowering himself, humbling himself to become a man. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, passage that we've referenced and danced around, but a passage that identifies both subjects for tonight, the humiliation and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. First, it says here in verse 7 and 8, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now what we want to do, knowing who Jesus Christ is, knowing that Jesus Christ is the eternal second person of the Godhead, the Bible tells us that in eternity past, Jesus Christ shared the same glory as the Father. 
When he prayed in John chapter 17, he referenced the glory I have with thee before the world was. So Jesus Christ, though he is the eternal second person of the Godhead and enjoyed all of that glory in eternity past, let's look at what the Bible says about his humbling. Okay, let's look at what the Bible says about his humiliation. Okay, I'm going to just give you some sub points, some thoughts with regard to this humiliation. The first thing I would say is given to us in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll say this. First, that the Bible says that Jesus Christ was made a little lower than the angels. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse number 6, it says this. But in, one in a certain place testified, and, and in telling you that, he's quoting from the Psalms. He's quoting Psalm 8. But he says, one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of of thy hands. Now when you turn, and we won't turn there for, for time's sake, but if you were to turn and look at the passage that's being quoted there in Psalm number 8, the psalmist reflects on the greatness of God's creation. And when you consider how you know, the greatness of his creation makes you consider how great he is. You know, if you think of God and how amazing and great and wonderful he is in all that he does, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that God condescends to even consider him? And yet the Bible tells us that he does condescend to man, though man is very low in the pecking order. In fact, mankind, it says here in this passage, is even lower than the angels. When we say that Christ humbled himself, we are not just saying that Christ took a step down. We are not saying that in his humbling of himself, he just took a, a small step down. The Bible, you know, you think about all the things that God has created. You think about all the things that God has made. You know, angels, angels are vastly superior to, to us, you know, in, in their power and in their glory. And even if Christ had submitted himself to becoming an angel, that would have been a step down. And yet, he even went further than that. He submitted himself to being made lower than the angels. Um, it says here in verse number 9, the same book, Hebrews 2, verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made lower, a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Jesus Christ humbled himself and came way down. When he became man, uh, he came to uh, a lower part of the pecking order. He did not just lower himself to becoming an archangel. He didn't lower himself to becoming any other of the angels. He lowered himself and was made in the likeness of men. So that's where we would start. We want to remind us that Jesus Christ and his humbling of himself came pretty far down. You think about the eternal glory of the second person of the Trinity. And then he humbled himself and took upon him the form of a servant. Now that would, that would be first. Secondly, I would say Christ at his incarnation did not come in glory or prestige. Jesus Christ was born in Israel. At that time, a rejected people, a people that were occupied the Bible tells us that he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, which if we read, and we have read the prophecy from Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, that tells us that Bethlehem is little among the thousands of Judah. You read in the New Testament how Joseph, who was physically Joseph in the line of David, Joseph, and you read the, the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, is in the kingly line of David and Solomon and all those that would follow. And yet when the New Testament opens up, he makes his living as a carpenter. There's no glory in that family. Isn't this the carpenter's son, one said? Indeed, the Bible presents to us Jesus Christ as a root out of dry ground. And he came into this world uh, not in glory. 
not in prestige, but in humility, humility and a humble fashion. Christ was not born into wealth. In the book of Luke, chapter 2, I would say third, that Christ was not born into wealth. The one of eternal glory, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the the one who uh, made all and created all, came into this world poor, very poor. In Luke chapter 2, in verse number 7, the Bible says, She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I want you to keep your finger there in Luke chapter 2 and turn real quick to Leviticus chapter 12 because the Bible gives us a description of how poor they were. Okay? In Leviticus chapter 12, and I won't go into all the details here, but Leviticus chapter 12 deals with some of the laws of purification. And I'll pick up with verse number 6, Leviticus Leviticus 12, verse 6. Leviticus 12, verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation under the priest, who shall offer it before the Lord and shall make an atonement for her and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath borne a male or a female. So what did verse 6 say? That she is supposed to bring a lamb for a burnt offering and a turtle dove for a sin offering. Right? Lamb for a burnt offering, turtle dove for a sin offering. But what does then verse 8 say? If she be not able to bring a lamb, then shall she bring two turtles or turtle doves. So the Bible presents this scenario for us where a a woman for a purification after having a child is supposed to bring what? A lamb and a turtle dove. But if she's not able to, okay, in other words, if she's poor, doesn't have a lamb, can't afford it, she can bring two turtle doves, the one for the burnt offering, the one for the sin offering. Now, where you kept your finger there in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, let's pick up with verse 21. It says, And when eight days were accomplished for circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, what did Mary have to bring? A pair of turtle doves. You remember that law that that allowed for you to bring two turtle doves if you were poor and couldn't bring a lamb? Joseph and Mary fell in that category. Jesus Christ was not born into riches. He was not born into wealth. Often as he traveled, he relied on the company of his friends and their homes. The Bible said that he had not where to lay his head. Foxes have their dens, birds have their nests, but... The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. When he died, the tomb that they placed him in was borrowed. And in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the scripture says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and in verse number 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that... Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Jesus Christ was not born into wealth. He was born into poverty. You say that's that's humbling, isn't it? Because you're talking again about who Christ is, who Christ was. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. 
it would have been humbling for him just to show his face in this world. It's humbling just for him to become a man. If Jesus Christ had become a man and had been, you know, the, the wealthiest of all of us, that would have still been humbling. That would have still been condescending. And yet the Bible tells us that he was poor. He didn't have a place to live. In Galatians chapter 4, part of his humiliation and the humbling of himself, we would say, is that he subjected himself to the law. Now, when you talk about the Lord, he's the lawgiver. He's the one that gave us the law. It's his law. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And yet, according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Christ humbled himself and subjected himself to the very law that he had created. Jesus Christ lived a perfect, he lived a righteous life, subject to all the law that God has given, that he had given. All the things that you can read about in the scripture, he subjected himself to and was made under the law. I would say that Jesus Christ humbled himself in the companions that he chose. Jesus didn't surround himself with wealthy people. He didn't surround himself with soldiers. He didn't surround himself with politicians. His closest friends were fishermen, a reviled tax collector, men that would have been outcast or thought at least of the lower class. Jesus Christ was humble in his appearance. And Jesus Christ is not understood to be the most handsome man that ever walked the streets of Jerusalem. In fact, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 tells us that he didn't have any form or comeliness. There was no beauty that we should desire him. Nobody looked at the face. Nobody looked at the body and the build of Jesus Christ and said, yep, there's something special about that man. No, he humbled himself. He was just made in the likeness of men. Not a superman. Yes, he was absolutely the greatest among us, and yet he took upon him the appearance of common man. It told us in Philippians chapter 2 that he came in the form of a servant. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 Matthew 20 and verse 28, it says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He came as a servant. The Bible says he made himself of no reputation. Now, the Greek word kenosis refers to an emptying. Christ veiled his glory. Now, I'm going to repeat this, what we've said before. Jesus Christ in becoming man never ceased to be God. And he did not lay aside his deity, but he did cover it. He did veil it. The Bible speaks of the veil of his flesh. And he covered his glory. You, you get to see it one time in his physical life. You get to see it one time before his resurrection, and that was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, but that was a one-off. That was a one-time occurrence there where his glory was revealed um, and not veiled as he walked in this world. He made himself of no reputation. He submitted himself to rejection. In Isaiah chapter 53, in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3, it says he is despised, he is rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He didn't have to do that. He could have come, and from the very moment that he came, uh, not allowed himself to be ridiculed in the least. He could have put on displays of his glory. Satan tempted him to do so, right? Um, but he didn't. He allowed himself to be rejected. 
And the Bible says that he submitted himself and became obedient unto death. Jesus Christ died at the hands of men. But when Philippians chapter 2 writes, it notes something particular. It says that he submitted himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Not just death, but even the death of the cross. Why does it, why does it separate that? Why does it signify that that is important? It's important because in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, Jesus Christ submitted himself unto death, but not just any death. What is Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 23? What does it say here? Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God. This is the verse that Paul is quoting in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, when he says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The Old Testament foretold and planted a curse on those, as it says there in verse 23, He that is hanged is accursed of God. And Jesus Christ submitted himself and became obedient unto death, but not just any death. This death that Christ died identified him with the very curse of God. This was a terrible death. This was a death that was, obviously it was humiliating for him in the flesh and what he endured at the hand of men and what he endured in identifying with the curse. Okay, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. That's why there's a particular phrase there where it says that he said, he submitted himself, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, Jesus Christ didn't get stoned and put in the grave. Jesus Christ died a death that said, this man is accursed. This man has been cursed of God. So we look at the first state of Christ's incarnation. That's his humiliation. All of these things we are saying about the eternal son of God. That he came into this world lower than the angels, poor no wealth, no money, no prestige, no honor, submitted himself to the law, submitted himself in appearance, submitted himself in his participation as a servant, no reputation, no earthly glory, rejected, dying at the hands of men, and even the death of the cross. So when we look at the incarnation, we look at it in two states. First, the humiliation, and that's what that is, what we've looked at. But number two, now let's look at the exaltation. Because let's go back to our text there in Philippians 2. Because there's a connecting word. In Philippians 2, verse 8, where he humbles himself and becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 9 says, wherefore. That means because of what I just said. Because of all that I just told you. In Christ humbling himself, making himself of no reputation, made in the likeness of men, made in the form of a servant, obedient unto death. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. We esteemed him not, but God hath highly exalted him. Because of what Christ did, because of his submission, because of his humiliation, the Bible says God has exalted him. And you can be sure from what we've looked at, no one in the history of this world has ever humbled themselves like Jesus Christ has. People have been born poor. People have been rejected. People have died. People have died terrible deaths. People have lived in this world with no friends. People have lived in this world under all those. Sure, all people have endured all those things. But no one has humbled themselves in, like Christ has because no one has come as far as Christ came to endure all of those things. You know, if I, if I end up poor, you would say of me, but yeah, but really, what does he deserve? What does he earn? Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God. He's full of eternal glory. He deserves all honor. He deserves all praise and adoration. If I die without any glory or honor, that's not really a big deal. What am I worthy of? So nobody has humbled themselves the way Christ has. 
And you can be sure that no one then will be exalted like Jesus Christ is and has been of God. Now let's look at the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Let me give you, I can't remember how many I just gave you about his humiliation. Let me give you six or seven things about his ex exaltation. First of all, Philippians 2.9 says that he, God hath highly exalted him and firstly given him a name which is above every name. There's no greater name. There's no greater honor. There's no greater person than the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, it says that neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name given under, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Men must come to God by way of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that is confirmed and reaffirmed to us as the apostles taught that there is no other name given whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ has been highly exalted by God. You say, why? Well, I just read that to you. Because of all that he did. Because of his humiliation, God has highly exalted him. It also says this, secondly, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Part of Christ's exaltation is that one day, every knee will bow to the man Christ Jesus. Now in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 and 11, Paul said this, and he's repeated that numerous times in the scripture. We know that every knee is going to bow. Romans 14, in verse number 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Now that is a quote from Isaiah chapter 45. And Paul re reiterates it here in Romans chapter 14, that every knee shall bow. And yet it's confirmed to us in Philippians chapter 2 that those knees bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Part of Christ's exaltation is that God is going to have all mankind, every knee is going to bow to him. Thirdly, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Okay? You say, well, of course every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, you know, everybody will say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. That's not what Philippians 2 is talking about, though. This is talking about the exaltation of Christ because of the humiliation that he submitted himself to. He is exalted by God and every tongue will confess this, that the man, Christ Jesus, is Lord. Every tongue shall confess that. And that does no harm. In fact, the Bible says that gives glory to God. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. I know we got a lot of verses tonight, and I appreciate you, you listening. But in his exaltation, what have we looked at? God gives him a name above every name. To him every knee will bow. To him every tongue will confess. Fourthly, the Bible tells us, that part of his exaltation is to now be seated at the right hand of God. In Hebrews 1 and verse number 3, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Likewise, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, Hebrews 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And yet now, that's the humiliation part, but what now? The exaltation. And now is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And what did Brother John mention to us on Sunday and in his recent say, What does it mean to be placed at someone's right hand? That is a position of honor. 
That is a position of exalted honor. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22 tells us, 1 Peter 3, verse 22 says, Who is gone into heaven, speaking of Christ, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Hebrews 2, verse 9 says it this way. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. You see, it; they're often linked together. That Christ endured, and then he was exalted. Humiliated, suffered, now exalted, now honored. The Bible tells us, fifthly, that part of his exaltation is that all things will be put in subjection to him. Hebrews 2, 7, we read this earlier, but it says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and it's set over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. If you don't think that Jesus Christ um, is the exalted one, if you don't think that he is the epitome, that he is the apex, that there's, if you think there's anything that's over him, he clarifies that he left nothing that is not put under him. Okay? Jesus Christ has been given all things in subjection to him. That is his place of exaltation. God has exalted the man Christ Jesus and put all things under him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 25, it tells us, it explains this in a little more detail, 1 Corinthians 15, where it tells us next that all his enemies will be put under his feet. All his enemies. In verse, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he put all enemies under his feet. Christ is now pictured, okay? Just as the Bible presents Christ and his coming to the earth uh, as, as his humiliation, and it was a suffering, and it was great grief, and Christ endured and died on the cross for sinners, humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Just as it describes the intense reality of that, it pictures to us now the Christ that endured all those things has been exalted. He's seated at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ is having all things put under his feet. And if you have any questions about what that means, the writer of Hebrews says that means there's nothing that's not put under his feet. All things, even the last enemy, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You say there's a great enemy. Well, Christ defeated that enemy, and Christ will continue to defeat that enemy as he resurrects his people from the grave. There aren't any enemies. There, there's nobody that's going to get the upper hand on Christ. God has set him above everything in his exaltation. And lastly, we would say that part of his exaltation is that God has committed all judgment to him. In Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30, it says this, And in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day, verse 31, in which he will judge the world in righteousness, by who? By that man whom he hath ordained. If you don't know who he's speaking of, he has given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. The one that God has raised from the dead and highly exalted, he says, by that man, he's going to judge this world someday. Jesus said that when he spoke in John chapter 5 about how the fathers committed judgment unto the son. And that is a very real, um, that is a very real committing that God has given his son. 
the Son will someday judge this world. You read Revelation chapter 19. Who is it that comes? Who is it that comes at the end of this world in, in judgment? It's Jesus Christ that comes back. It's Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19 that it said the sword goes out of his mouth. And we read about the destruction of the beast and the false prophet. We read about the destruction of those that have been, what? His enemies. And all enemies get put under his feet. Who? The man, Christ Jesus. You would not come away from the scriptures after seeing what Christ has done, after seeing what Christ submitted himself to, God has exalted him to a place of unimaginable honor and glory. Just as no one ever came any lower than Christ did, God will never exalt anyone the way that he is exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. His exaltation is so high that it can truly and literally be said every single person that is living, that it will live, or that has ever lived, what will they do? They will bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, there's no escape. There, no one is going to escape the recognition that, yep, God has exalted the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is Lord. He submitted himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. And today, Christ is in his place of exaltation. And guess what? There won't be any more humiliation for him. When Jesus Christ comes the next time, he's not coming back lowly and sitting upon an ass. He's not coming back in humble fashion. He's not coming back into poverty. He's not coming back lowly. He's coming back as king. He is coming back as Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords, and he'll put all enemies under his feet. Okay? Men's hope of salvation, then, the Bible tells us, rests only in Jesus Christ. God has ordained and God has ordered it so that because of all that Christ has done, there is no hope in any other. The apostles recognize that there is no salvation in any other name than the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anything that men could do to be saved, we, we would tell them to do it. You know, we're not trying to be silly or we're not trying to be flippant with, with people and their destinies. If I thought that there was something tonight that you could do, that people could do to go to heaven, I, I'd tell you what that was. And yet the Bible time and again refers us back to, no, it's Christ. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that submitted himself. He is the one that sacrificed himself. He is the one that made the offering pleasing to God. All hope of salvation lies only in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we point men to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has exalted him. God has set him up over all. And every knee someday is going to bow and recognize what God has done in exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that? The Bible tells us that not only has God exalted him, we'll look at it one day and every person that has ever lived will say, yep, he is. He is Lord. And everyone will recognize that. And again, you say, well, is, yeah, because Jesus is God, right? Nope. The man, Christ Jesus, every knee will bow to him. Okay. So when we talk about the incarnation, those are the two states. Christ humbled himself, and now he is exalted. And he'll be exalted forevermore there there is no more there is no more humble there there's no more humbling of jesus christ he's been exalted by the father and he is forever going to be our exalted lord all right all right let's all stand together we're going to have a word of prayer and be dismissed appreciate your attention again tonight and all your attention and patience through these lessons uh, go ahead we'll, we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer as we all stand together